Well, we are right on time. It is 10 a.m. Good morning uh, or good afternoon, if that's already the case for you. My name is Françoise Moudoute, and I am uh, the CEO of the African Women's Development Fund, which I will most often call AWDF uh, for convenience. I am so delighted and thankful uh, to all of you for uh, joining us today. Uh, we are still waiting for a few um, of our participants to join, but the panel is nearly complete. Um, we have interpretation as well uh, that is available, I believe. So you should be able to go to the interpretation globe uh, at the bottom of your skin, screen, sorry, and choose the language that is available, English or French. Uh, if there are any issues with interpretation, please uh, put a note in the chat to the host and panelists. And I uh, by uh, clicking in the chat and addressing your message to everyone uh, who you are and where you're joining us from. Meanwhile, I'm going to turn to our lovely panel um, and um, starting, and, and yeah, I just want to, to first say thank you to you all and just say a little bit about why we really wanted to convene this, this space. Um, a few months ago, I, I found out about uh, when women speak and, uh, and I, I was like, oh, you know, I've been in Ghana for about a year. I really want to learn about the women's movement. And so I went to watch it and I was mesmerized. I learned so much. And I thought this is such a fantastic way of learning. It's a fantastic way of uh, finding out about uh, who are the, the feminists whose uh, shoulders we stand on as we do our work. And I was like, everybody needs to see this. <laughs> and a few of my colleagues also uh, watched it and, and watched it once or twice. And we were like, what can we do as, as AWTF2? Uh, amplify this because it's very much part of our role to do so. Um, so this movie, I'm going to say very little about it because we are so fortunate to have part of the team that worked on it uh, to, um, to be with, on the panel today. Um, and I will introduce them in just a minute. But um, uh, my understanding is that this, doc this is a documentary that uh, <clears throat> Is, is part of a bigger project called An Archive of Activism on Gender and Public History in, in Post-Colonial Ghana, which we'll probably heard, hear a little bit more about. And this is uh, a project that uh, researches on, and focuses on Ghanaian women's organizing and campaigning strategy uh, on the uh, various governments um, between the mid 60s and the early 90s in Ghana. And so this, I, I really love the movie and uh, we're going to, we are so lucky and thankful that we're able to show a few snippets in this webinar uh, and that we can discuss it with our panel. So let me turn to our panel. There's quite a few of us here and I'm going to start with the team uh, who worked on the, <clears throat> on the film itself. I apologize if I sound like a little uh, off, but I'm just post COVID and I think the brain fog that people talk about is actually a thing, <laughs> I think. So if, I, if I'm not very coherent, feel, feel free to ask me to repeat or to rephrase. Um, so let's start with, um, I want to start with uh, Aseye. Tamakloe, I don't know if I'm pronouncing this right, and please correct me if I didn't, if I'm not. Um, who is a filmmaker? Welcome, a filmmaker and lecturer at the National, a National Film and Television Institute in, in Accra here in Ghana, and who you've worked at the, as an editor, um, director, and producer on a, a number of local interna and international productions, and. Um, you're also a co-programmer for the Film Africa Festival in London and other, other festivals like the European Festival, uh, Ghana, et cetera. And you are 
uh, you have played a central role in just putting this work together, this film together. And so I'm so grateful for your time because you'll be able, we really wanted to have you so you can tell us about the why, the what, but also the how of your role in documenting uh, this, uh, this beautiful film. And congratulations and thank you for offering us with this um, gorgeous piece of documentation for our movement. Uh, we also have... Thank you very much. Thank you so much for joining us. Uh, I'm going to uh, also ask... Uh, I say, is, did I, did I in, introduce you properly? Did I miss anything? Because all of you have such long... No. Time, I don't know how to choose. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, it's fine. The introduction right. is succinct and fine. Okay, thank yeah, you thank so you. much. Thank you so much. Um, on, our, on the team, we also have uh, Professor Akosua Adomako Ampofo, uh, who, uh, together with Dr. Kate Skinner, have been a uh, part of the project, right, to, uh, to put together this film. And I just wanted to ask you, both of you, if you wanted to introduce yourselves and tell us what is your role uh, in, in the whole project. So, Professor Akosua, maybe you can start. Thank you very much, um, Francoise. You sound perfect. Uh, not at all like somebody who's coming out of COVID. So I'm, I'm really sorry to hear that and wish you, you. Uh, bon courage and, uh, you know, get, get perfect health soon. And a big thank you, thank you to AWDF for being a part of this. We're, we are really excited. Um, this project really started with Kate sitting at the University of Birmingham and calling out to me and saying, Akosia, the British Academy has some money. Do we want to get some of that money and document uh, women's uh, lives, women's stories? Kate is an historian. She'll say more about herself. And I'm a sociologist. So bringing together our interests in women's lives in Ghana, both of us having been um, professors, uh, scholars, teachers uh, in gender studies and women's studies. It was like, okay, if the British Academy will give us the money, we will document lives, we'll document stories, we'll put them in an archive, we'll make them available. And then I, I said, you know what, let's make a film because how many people, let's be honest, will read those journal articles and how many people, we, we hadn't even gotten as far as thinking about putting the transcripts in an archive, which we ultimately said we would do. So at that point, it was just about doing the research and wow, let's do a film. And at that point, I said, I have the perfect person. She's a lecturer in film. She's a director of film. She has many years of experience under her belt. And um, she also happens to be my PhD student. So perfect person to bring on board to make the film portion of this uh, larger project happen. And so, um, yeah, so, so that was the idea behind the film. And we eventually managed to interview 16 women. As I say, it keeps reminding us there are actually 19 women in the film because we have some footage uh, from the archives as well. Um, COVID, we, we started with a list of over 50 and we eventually shrunk it to 16. We had, we had more than that, but COVID shut it down. And so we couldn't go to as many parts of the country um, as we wanted to. Two of the main things that we really wanted to share were, one, the fact that women's activism is not new, that this has been going on uh, for many years, and two, that, you know, this, this is not a foreign import. Often we hear uh, stories like, yeah, they just are picking things from, you know, from Western women. And as uh, Professor Chikata says in the film, she thinks that actually that kind of accusation is a form of abuse when you want to dismiss the work um, that women are doing. So that's, um, you know, Thank you. Really very brief the, the background. <clears throat> Thank you so much. And I really appreciate you taking the time because I know you have to go to another program in a few minutes and you I'm have so to sorry. excuse yourself. But thank yeah, you so me, much. Let me just add one other thing that uh, yes, okay. many of these uh, women in the film are women who I have walked along with. So in, in a little sense, it's also part of my story so, you know, because I know many of them personally um, or more intimately, and because we've worked together, many of the things that they talk about are things that I also um, have been intimately involved with. 
So thank you very much again for the thank you. Thank you so much. Um, and we hope that we can continue this conversation even after this webinar as you need to you need to leave quite soon. <laughs> thank you. And I want to, and you mentioned uh, Dr. Kate Skinner, uh, who is also part of the team. And would you also like to introduce yourself briefly before we invite uh, the, the rest of the panel to do the same? Thank you, Francoise, and thank you to the organization for inviting us all and um, helping us to disseminate the film um, into key audiences. Um, so I work at the University of Birmingham in an African Studies and Anthropology unit. And I came to this project, I think, with two main motivations. So one was that the historian inside me um, was concerned about the gaps in the national archives. So under military regimes in particular, archiving of governmental records was often quite poor. So there was this feeling that the 70s and 80s, how are in future, how are people in Ghana and elsewhere going to be able to study that period of history? So there was an archiving element. And then the other thing that sort of drove me in the project was this consistent problem of inside Ghana, women's activism being painted as something that's Western and imported, which is very delegitimizing. And I, on the other hand, in the academic field, you've got a lot of critiques of feminism as not purely being a white led movement or not purely being about white women. And there's a lot of work on African feminism. So for me, the attraction of the film was being able to take these two kind of challenges and actually put at the center a story told by women who were Ghanaians working in Ghana, but also internationally in the 70s, 80s and 90s, and actually look at their stories and how they recount that period of history. And I think that helps to challenge the idea that this is a kind of a Western thing or that white women have always been leading and African women following. I, I feel like the film is gonna help in challenging these sort of myths. So that attracted me. And we were just fortunate that the, um, the kind of research funding that opened up in the UK in that time, the Global Challenges Research Fund and the British Academy Sustainable Development Programme, we were just lucky that the kind of research they wanted to fund mapped quite neatly with what we wanted to do. And that was how we were able to pursue the project. Thank you so much for sharing some of that background and also your personal interests. Uh, and I think it's really interesting because what really strikes me also in the film is how much uh, we are not distracted by commentary. We're hearing directly from uh, the activists who are involved. Um, <clears throat> So uh, I'm going to finish uh, the introductions and then we'll, we'll move to, uh, forward uh, with uh, a bit of a, an excerpt of the film. We could have stopped here and just only talked with the team, but it was super important, first of all, to have uh, one of the 16, actually 19, um, uh, women uh, activists who were very part of the conversation and who are featured of, uh, in, the, in the film. And so I'm so honored uh, that uh, Mrs. Hilary Bedema, I think I got that right, maybe not. Um, thank you so much for being uh, with us. And, uh, and I was so, so happy to, to see you after having seen you in the film. So you, <laughs> and thank you so much for making the time to, to be with us. So you are, uh, uh, if, I, if I'm not mistaken, a lawyer, a human rights and gender activity, uh, equality activist, and currently working also as a gender consultant. I'm not, uh, the way your bio is long and impressive. Don't worry about that. I would like for you to tell us what you yeah. want us to know <laughs> about yourself and also a little bit why you said yes to this project. Very well. Um, I said yes to the project because I realized that women's stories needed to be told. And they are not always told the way men's stories are told or the way men are told. 
So, uh, can you hear me? We can, can hear you so yeah. so. Can you hear but me? I now? Yeah, I can hear you now. So, if you're better off video, please. With a video off, yes. Once That's you've seen me fine. off with a video, yes. I'm very sorry. I had problems with my internet at home. So, I had to move to a hotel and I'm by the oh, poolside. Wow. So, the connectivity is not the best. Yes. Oh. So, I'm at a nearby room. Very well. I said, yes, I was very impressed, first of all, at this novel, the novelty of the idea. And please, at any time, if you cannot hear me, please give me a hand signal and uh, I'll, I'll try and just uh, go back okay, a little bit. Very well. The novelty, because uh, men, women's stories, women's histories are not told in the same way as men's. And they are not told by men. And they are not told the same way as men's histories are told. So this innovative approach to chronicling women's experiences, what I will call the micro histories, uh, was very appealing, uh, inviting to me. And uh, when I heard about the background, uh, about the scope, the vista of women going to be interviewed, I thought, yes, this is a good start. Uh, so that we don't lose these histories uh, in the way we've lost so much uh, of women's accounts. So that was it. And then the broad uh, scope of uh, women, I, I, I had uh, 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 an insight into some of them, who, who some of the interviewees were going to be, and their experiences, again, was... Um... Oh dear. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Yes. Very yes, can hear you. Again, this was this was very very uh, appealing to me. Um, in the in the end, when the product came out, I was really thrilled because right now uh, I work. Uh, part of my work is at the CEDA, UN CEDA committee, and I was just thrilled that these accounts put together fit into all the thematic uh, areas of CEDA. So it was as if we had gone local to global and back to local because these are issues on the ground. Uh, I think I'll stop here to give others a, a chance to come in and then I can build up on this very fascinating aspect of, 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 of the outcome of the film. Absolutely, thank you so much. Thank you so much, Hilary. Um, I want to turn to uh, uh, you, Kina, Kina Likimani. Thank you so much for joining us. I'm so excited that you're here. Um, not least because I'm, I've been fangirling around your work uh, for, for a really long time, but, but also because I think it's so interesting to have you as somebody who is part of the, the generation of uh, feminists who followed the ones that are uh, featured in the film. And so that is really the why I'm most excited uh, to have your contributions today. So can you tell us a little bit about yourself first? And then maybe the first question I will ask is, uh, you, uh, you've seen the movie, what was the most striking thing for you about the movie first? Thank you, and thank you for inviting me. And thank you to um, the producers, the directors, and everybody involved in this uh, film. Um, I'm Kina, I'm a feminist. I'm a writer. I work with the Parliamentary Monitoring Organization. I am part of the women's movement. Um, I have a publishing house. Yeah, that's me. <laughs> um, and your question was, what was, I've lost the, the question. The, the initial question was like, what did you find most striking when you saw the film? Um, hmm. I think just seeing, um, because the, as you said, the, the women, this has been my life. Um, so based on my own background, I've had more interactions with women, with feminists than most, I think. Um, and so I'm very familiar with, uh, with, the, with the women interviewed, with the issues addressed. Um, but I think that it's, it was just, it's just so heartwarming to see it on film um, um, and the impact it makes. I, um, e even for, 
because I don't particularly care. In fact, I don't care if if people think that feminism is a Western. We are not. I'm not here to justify African <laughs> feminism to anybody. But I think that um, it's it's given that it's my background. It can't. It's not something that stays in your background. You see, these are the people who have um, um, trailblazed. The people who had um, then and a lot more who were not featured. You know. People like how are Yakubu? I mean, there's just like so much. And so it's very, um, it's heartwarming, it's encouraging. Um, it's just wonderful, actually. That that's just what I would say. Yeah. Thank you so much, Kina. And um, I'm going to turn to you, uh, Professor Pumla Dineo Kola, uh, who uh, is joining us uh, as a as a Professor, full professor, I don't know the difference, but I can see it matters, a full professor of literary and cultural studies. Uh, you've been professor in the Department of uh, African Literature at the University of, of Wit. I don't know how you pronounce the full name of the university. I don't want to butcher it. I have a thing with pronouncing people's name and place, places wrong, so I'm going to keep to Wit in South Africa. Um, and um, you also have a really long CV, but I have to say the reason why I'm so, there's two reasons why I'm very, very excited that you're here with us today. The first one is I'm so uh, impressed with your writing and your work, and I've learned so much from reading your various books, uh, but also because I think from where you stand, um, when I saw this, this film, I was, so I'm not Ghanaian, I, do, I, I live in Ghana, I'm from Cameroon, and, uh, and I'm thinking how much this resonates uh, and all the ways it's different from where I come from. And I was thinking it's such, it's, it is not interesting or valuable only for Ghanaian feminists from, from, it's really something that resonates across the continent. So we were quite excited that you said yes to our invitation to share um, your perspectives from where you sit. So when we will uh, watch a little bit of a, a, a little part of the movie, I'm going to ask you a little bit more about that. But for now, I just wanted to also ask you uh, what's, what is something that was really striking from you from that perspective when you watch the movie? And also, of course, if you want to tell us more about yourself, please, you're welcome to start there. Thank you very much, Francoise. Um, um, I am very happy. I'm really, really excited to be here. I'm so, I was so excited to be asked and I love the film for reasons that I, I'm sure I'll get a chance to say more about why um, in the larger discussion. I'm very, I'm just really excited to be in the same room with all the people that are in, 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 the, in the room. I am, as you said, I mean, I, I'm an academic. Um, so that's my day job. I'm an academic, I'm a professor of literature um, and, and, and literary and cultural studies. I am a feminist author. Um, and I'm part of the African feminist movement. So I'm a feminist um, activist as well. And I, um, I, I, I was very excited. I mean, I loved this film. I loved it as a, I loved it both for its um, content, but also for its how, how it presents the content. I mean, watching it, so many things went off in my mind and they were all kind of delightful and challenging me to think in certain ways, but I also just thought it was a really beautiful film. Um, and um, just kind of, and, 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 and being able to listen to, to, to all of these phenomenal, um, radical African women um, in their own voices and, and, and to get a sense of their, not just, even when you sometimes, because sometimes, you know, a lot of them were names that I knew, but I knew them on the page. I knew them from reference or from reading them. But it was so wonderful to get a sense of their nuances and their quirks and how they move their bodies and their cheekiness. And it was just so, so in addition to, I suppose, some of what we'll talk about, about the content, I just, it was just a delight, just the, 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 the experience of watching it. It was such a beautiful film and it was such a, um, and, and, and the women interviewed in it also just gave me just enormous, enormous, enormous joy. Um, and, and of course, also just co-signing on what the wonderful Ina um, um, just before me um, has, 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 also, has also said that, um, that, you know, even when you're sometimes dealing with material that's partly um, familiar, um, its presentation in this film was just um, remarkable and joyful. So I'll stop there. 
for now. Thank you. Thank you so much. And I couldn't agree more. I think it, I also was, I just found it enchanting the way it presented, you know, like the animation. And so we, I think it's a perfect time to show a few images. Um, somebody asked uh, in, the, in the chat, uh, where can we watch the full movie? The full movie is not yet available online. Um, it's being presented in various uh, areas, and I know that uh, we can uh, hear more later from the team. But what we wanted uh, is to show two uh, excerpts from the film, uh, so, so that those of us in the room who have not yet seen the film have a sense of what we're talking about and can fully be part of the conversation. So I'm going to ask uh, my colleagues from the comms team to start with the first, it's going to be about 15 minutes, and we wanted to take this to really show uh, a critical shift that I, I found interesting in the in the film on when um, the I'm not going to spoil, I'm not I don't do spoilers, but just an interesting time of uh, there was a bit of a shift on the scope, um, but also how it looks like the big picture and the individual. Um, a, a journey of one of the activists uh, featured. So, Karen, if you're ready, this would now be a really good time to show the, the excerpt, the first excerpt. <laughs> The market culture, I was <laughs> which had always been dominated by females in this country. The, the issues that came up with the market and um, when they go to go and bring goods from across the country and sleep on these trucks and their stories, their stories were difficult stories. It is knowing those stories that made me so angry when 1979 came. And market women were being targeted as, as the people who were, what was their name, Kalabule. <laughs> My view was that it was the military, after all, that had been in power since January 1972. They had led us into the mess. They. So why should I now suddenly think that the military had some big answer? No. No, I, I didn't. I didn't stop to think about it. I did not. The soldiers did not understand why the market queens could take things in bulk before the coup. Plantain farmers will bring their produce to the markets. When that farmer is coming, or when that um, wholesaler is coming, we didn't have hotels as we have them now. The wholesaler knows nobody. So the queen mother for plantain will then have to take charge of the whole bulk. The queen mother will break the bulk and give to family heads within the market system. The queen mother has to stand surety and make sure that she collects all the money and pay the money 
to the wholesaler. Dealing with the soldiers, I taught the women to look at the twine that has been woven, yes, and to take note of the color because they were not going to be able to read the names, they can't read the numbers, but at least the stripes here and the color of, of that they can describe to me. And I got hearing some were disciplined, but some also came to me to tell me that if I get dismissed, but I will not get dismissed because this is our era. During the early stages of the revolution, when the market, Mokola market was raised to the ground, a lot of women were displaced. They were blamed for the food shortages in the country. Women were suffering generally. A memorandum was signed from the NCWD, spearheaded by the then chairperson, Mrs. Anidiake, to government, the military government, to ensure that women do not suffer unduly. In the memorandum, the NCW pleaded for the women who have been displaced because of the raising down of the Makola number one market. Eventually, the new Makola was built, you know, and was able to house some of the women. I became editor of the Daily Graphic in 1979. It's a very chaotic period in our history. It, it was, um, okay, so where does one start with these things? Uh, Fly Lieutenant Jerry Rawlings had attempted to stage a coup d'etat and had failed and was being tried he and his wife were friends of mine and ours. When he was being tried, I was at the trial in Burma camp every day. And anyway, everybody knows what then happened. And then there was a, a, a violent overthrow of the, of the military regime then, with whom I had had a very difficult relationship. I had been writing a column in the graphic, which I called Thinking Aloud. Aloud, not A-L-O-U-D, but you are allowed to think. And uh, there were times when, for weeks, I couldn't get my article published because the editor would, he would send it to the Ministry of Information and they would say no. We used to have a joke about my unpublished works. But anyway, so this, this was me. It was well known that I had become quite a critic of the government. It was in the midst of all this that the Jerry Rawlings coup happened. days later, we were at work when the Commissioner Afre, who was the Minister for Commissioner for Information, came to tell me that I, had, I was being appointed editor of the graphic. In those days, that was it. You know, you've been appointed and that's it. Okay, so I became editor, then they killed these people, Achampong and Utoka. And I just thought, no. So I wrote. 
an editorial saying they were out of order. And um, <laughs> it, um, it made a lot of people unhappy because the general tone seemed to be, uh, what was the slogan, let the blood flow, let the blood flow. And they, some people took it personally that I was trying to uh, stop the blood uh, f from flowing. And I was, uh, people felt that people had done wrong and they should be killed and anyway. There were demonstrations. They came to the offices of the graphic and ransacked my office, and there were, you know, everywhere on from the on the uh, walls in Legon all the way to the graphic, all the way to the stadium, everywhere. He or he must die, he or he must go, all those things. Let the blood flow. Well, we held our nerves. And in a way, uh, the fly lieutenant himself uh, held his nerve, I suppose you, you could say because he was under a lot of pressure to remove me, because people felt that I was not um, sympathetic to the revolution. In fact, one of the soldiers said to me that he had noticed that I had never called it a revolution. There can be no revolution unless the people, all of us, really understand what it is all about and springing from that understanding genuinely commit our support to it. The graphic was doing recipes and fashion and that on the women's page because there was no direction. By the minute we entered 1975 International Women's Year, that is when it hits all of us that we should refocus and bring real issues of women to the forefront. And so there was a bit of um, a shifting in what we were doing on that page. And so issues like widowhood rights, issues like um, treatment to widows and their children when their husbands die interstate, family planning, too many children, be some being abandoned, no education, you know, those are the issues that traditionally they were not discussed, but we wanted to bring in. And with uh, Elizabeth also made quite a good impression on, on graphic generally, especially the editorial, because she was um, quite outspoken and quite a firm lady and in the editorial section. It gave us all the women in editorial that kind of edge to be all, also to be able to speak up in the columns or whatever reporting that we were doing. And I tell you what, I wrote an article on, um, I think it was on polygamy or something like that. And do you know what my own dad said to me? I shouldn't have written the article when he read it the next morning, that if I had discussed it with him or if I had sought opinion, he would have asked me not to write that kind of, so now thinking back, it's because he was guilty. He was practicing it, it and he thought it was right. The people of Ghana have democratically elected me. I call on all in the true spirit of patriotism to come together as one united country determined to solve the many and difficult problems facing us. Thank you so much. Thank you so very much for sharing uh, this, um, this, this part of the movie. I think it's uh, such an interesting, um, 
it's, it's like, like, I think it was about 15 minutes, but it showed so much. It shows, um, it shows, uh, it shows what is uh, the power of one voice and the inspiration of one voice. But it shows also the danger and the, the pressure uh, of, of keeping that voice steady. It shows, I also find very interesting how it shows like the contribution to the bigger, bigger uh, history of the country and, and also, and the women's contributions to that. And also the shift towards a more focused <clears throat> Uh, a more focused approach to women's issues towards the later part of the excerpt. So thank you so much for uh, allowing us also to show part of the movie. I think it really helps uh, give, uh, give body to uh, this, uh, uh, this uh, conversation. And, and I want to echo also what both uh, uh, Pumla and, and Kina were saying about how this is such a beautiful film, you know, the use of animation uh, which um, I, I'm, I'm told is uh, a, an addition that was suggested by uh, Akosua Asamu Obea, in addition to, uh, you know, having the archives and the interviews. So let me maybe turn to you, Asaye, first, um, because I wanted to really ask if you can tell us two things. One is uh, about the documenting, the importance of documenting for you and how, uh, how you went about, um, let me just say, like I, I, I heard you speak at, at, the, at the showing that I attended and you were speaking about the hours of images, of interviews, of everything that you have and the difficulty to, to pick a little bit to fit into, into this relatively short uh, documentary. I wanted to ask you two things. One is around like what you have learned like if there's one really big lesson you've learned from that uh, group uh, and that part of the, that group of activists and that part of, of history, but also about the documenting itself, the process of documenting, the importance of documenting those voices. If you want to share anything about that. Okay, first let me apologize about my internet. I'm shifting between about three different networks. So if I go off, pardon me. Um, it's just a bad internet day if there's anything like that. Um, yes, it's, I think for a documentary like this, a, a lot of hard choices have to be made um, because I, like, like I said before, we have many hours of, of material and you also want, be, beyond wanting to document um, women who have been at work and have been doing this for a while, and you also want to sustain people's interest. You know, it's, it's trying to find a balance where, I mean, for, if, if it was for academics and people in activism, it really is not a problem what you put there so far as it's addressing the things we always talk about. But where we are trying to bring in <laughs> the non-activists and try to get them to understand the journey and where we've come from and what we're, we're working on and what has been done and also a general public and then there's also the male side, then you have to take into consideration many, many more things as to uh, one, what will make be impactful, what will, will awaken people, what will create a certain level of consciousness or reconscientizing, uh, some form of education, some form of representing history, and also challenging the status quo because beyond everything this film gives us, I think that it really falls into what film as a political tool with, uh, is, you know, and also the fact And I think he has come to also do that. So to, to, to try to, you know, make the film have all of these qualities, um, that's where the hard choices come. Like the song we've always sung, we had to sometimes kill certain darlings, but also to make um, the stories of these women in very various forms available. Because I mean, just the fact that most some interviews were about three hours, some were about five hours. I think the, the shortest interview we had was about two, two hours, 40 minutes. And different aspects of life, of work, of activism, 
of, of all our caste was in everybody's story. Now, uh, we needed to find ways of representing everybody, what they've done, their different stories and connecting it uh, to make a holistic story about the journey pre independence, post independence and almost into today's world as well. So the decision, I mean, we've had, I think this film has, I can't, at least about 10 major different cuts, you know, because we started from a very long process where I think our first cut was almost about four or five hours, you know, and we kept shrinking and shrinking. And also the, 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 the attempt to also use archival material to give the work some its integrity, to also situate it so that, you know, people can connect. So it doesn't feel like we are speaking out of vacuum. And that because also when it comes to women's work and activism, some people think that we are just singing some Kwekwanansi story when people hear the things that people have done. Somehow, I mean, that's how it comes across because there's, al there's always a certain prejudice that they couldn't have done it, you know? And so because of that, we needed all of this um, archival materials as well to concretize that, listen, Ani Jage lived, she was a human being and she did this and that and that, look at her. Esther Kru lived, she did this and that. The coups happened. This was what the newspapers were saying. This was what the women were doing, et cetera, et cetera. And so all of that, I mean, culminates into trying to put this together, even looking for the different sound bites, even recreating the sound designs to, to take us into the different times and, and give us this, vivid picture, something that um, we probably, even if you read, you, you wouldn't really get it. Your imagination may not stretch that far and, and, and give it to us visually. So all these different uh, dif uh, decisions had to come in so that we could give you a, a, a bit of a slice of what uh, the, the, the bigger picture of, of, of what we got. And so everything that has been put here has um, been thought through. It didn't come by chance uh, because sometimes you have somebody say something in her like 100th minutes, but somewhere in the film is in the 10th minutes, you know, what, what should come before what, what should concretize what. Some things may sound repetitive and redundant, but it's intentional because we need to stress certain points, etc. So all of this came into taking um, this decision. Thank you so much. Yeah. Thank you so much, I say. And I think what I'm, I'm also hearing from you is that documenting is, uh, is a very careful process. And I think you, you talked about uh, the political aspect of it, but also the need for, uh, sometimes a bit unfortunate, the need to back our voices with archives, you know, to, to maintain legitimacy of the, I mean, that's just, it's very carefully crafted and, and you can tell. So thank you, thank you so much for that. Um, and I think that's a lesson that all of us can should keep in mind as we think about documenting moving moving forward. Let me turn to you, uh, Hilary. Uh, you are one of the, um, the the activists who are being interviewed towards the the latter part of the film, and and you were saying earlier you're making that interest very interesting contribution around the linkages with what's happening on the ground and the bigger picture of what's happening in the UN uh, and, and including the work that you're doing uh, uh, and you keep doing at the CEDAW. Uh, I, I, think it's, I think it's interesting to look at this movie or this documentary with the, uh, the privilege of uh, hindsight. Mm -hmm. uh, it's, it's, just, it's just fascinating, um, even though we can feel the how harsh this experience can be. So I was just thinking, it's, it's such a, for me, it's very emotional for me to be speaking um, with and not about uh, the activists, you and the other activists who, are, who have done this, such an important contribution. So when you think about it with that hindsight, what do you think is that the biggest contribution of this generation of, of feminists in Ghana uh, both to you know gender equity and women's rights, but also to move, move and building for feminist move and building in the country. Thank you very much. 
And um, indeed, hindsight is beautiful, 2020. I walked some of these experiences. So for me, it was a recounting uh, of uh, history. I lived through the era that is uh, portrayed in the film. So what is the greatest contribution? I don't know about the greatest contribution, but from my perspective, first of all, addressing the issue about whether activism, feminism, advocacy is a foreign import. This movie, this film puts paid to that argument. Even before this can be couched or could have been couched in the lexicon of the marketplace, it is happening. We have seen, in, even in the brief clip you showed, the action or the work of women in economic activity and in the media. We have seen how uh, women broke uh, stereotypes, withstood violence as they were going about their economic activity with the assistance of the uh, media, how they were resolute and resilient about their livelihoods and employment, how they uh, insisted on having their social and economic life, and how activism advocacy helped and promoted this, the denial of their access to justice, the instant justice they were subjected to, and issues of family life, equality in the home, especially around polygamy. This is a brief clip you have shown. There's so much more about health, about education. Now, what is the great, what, what is it about, what is the hindsight, the benefit of hindsight to me? First is that there is a confluence of all these experiences, which has, have been concretized in, from my perspective, biased legislation. Today, we have legislation on the rights of women uh, as autonomous people. They can hold their own passports. We have women's property rights. They can own property. They can uh, inherit property from spouses, that's the PNDC law 111. We have had amendments to the criminal law on uh, inimical practices like ritual, servitude, FGM, honor crimes, marital rapes, marital rape, and the whole plethora of legislation that has arisen from all these experiences and activism, and which, as I said earlier, have grounding in the international uh, normative or legal milieu. So for me, it is fascinating that these experiences, local, grassroots, down to earth, have found expression, have been um, uh, put beyond contention, are justifiable. That means that by that I mean can, can be sought in court and reliefs had which was not always the case. So this concretization for me is very critical. And it is, um, as I said, a culmination. It did not happen in vacuum. It happened from the experiences and the activism. It's now together. Today, we are looking at new fields that seem as strange as these did then when you hear um, uh, Vicky talking about uh, polygamy uh, and so on. That seemed equally strange. But that gives me hope that we can gain ground in the future. Uh, again, I, I cannot leave without talking about the bravery of, uh, I, I cannot close, the bravery of these uh, women and their insistence on voice in the, in the face of intimidation. And this is why it is important that women's histories are told by women. If this had been told by another group, I will name them, we probably would not have had the same effect. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. They shall remain unnamed. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you so much. That, that is, I think your, this last point you're making is, is, is very, very much resonates with us because I think it goes back to the point of what is being documented and, 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 but also how and the power of 
our own voice is so critical. Mm -hmm. So thank you so much for sharing that. Yeah, Kina, let me you. let me turn to you uh, mm -hmm. because as I was saying earlier, your perspective as uh, someone who has, as you said, this is part of your life. It's not it's not part of history books or or anything like that. It's very much part of your life, but it's also part of <clears throat> the generation kind of a little bit before yours. And I'm very interested in the influence and the, you know, like that kind of passing of strength of bravery of agendas. And that's really what I wanted to ask you about. When you look at, at what is being uh, presented, uh, that, that change and that action that they took, and also looking at your own journey, how have you been um, inspired uh, by by those in kind of what you do, but also your experiences, and what do you think is the inspiration that the the movement, as it uh, it continues to exist today, as has gained from from that group? Of thank activity? you, thank you for the questions. First of all, <laughs> thank you to um, Auntie Hillary. I could listen to her all day. You know the way she makes connections is just amazing every single time. So thank you. Um, well, <laughs> frankly. Mm -hmm. My whole life is the way I live personally um, would not be possible without the feminist movement. Um, now we don't, we like to talk about we are not doing personal choice feminism, but literally in every aspect of our lives as women in Ghana, um, like um, Auntie Hillary pointed out, that it's been backed by law and we are still fighting, you know, we are fighting for the affirmative action to be passed. But I think that um, it's so important that we understand that, that you know, I, I always say that if I, if I ever write my memoir, I will call it, I lost the country, I'm going to change the title because Ghana was on a certain path where women's struggle was con uh, is concerned, a path very much instigated and charted by, by the women's movement. But also, uh, 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 but also it was also in, you know, enabled by Kwame Nkrumah. And so when we look at our history, we should be much further along in terms of what the country is able to do for women and, the and more freedoms granted than we currently, like we shouldn't have to fight for affirmative action to be passed in Ghana in 2022. But it's not possible for, and this is why the document, this film is so important. It is not possible for any Ghanaian woman, and I mean any, we can talk about um, where um, um, the freedoms may be lacking and are lacking um, between different classes of women, but it is not possible for any Ghanaian woman to live their life today without, um, without encountering some aspect of, the, of, of some freedom, some access that the women's movement has made possible in Ghana. I mean, we are talking about land rights. We are talking about interstate succession. We are talking about, we are talking about divisions in the Ghana police set aside to deal with women's issues and the patriarchy, it's not possible. Um, it, we, we wouldn't be like, it's, it's just, it just wouldn't be happening. Um, and, and so it's, 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 it's and, and, and it's just very, I mean, I wouldn't be here. I mean, I didn't know that married women, I mean, my mother wasn't married and so she had her own passport, but I didn't know um, before um, Justice um, Kwenyanya was speaking, that uh, as a married woman, you couldn't get a passport in Ghana as late as what the seventies without your husband's consent. That's insane. I mean, thinking about it now, there's no way it's like, what is that? What is that? But that was what, less than some 40 years ago. And the fact that we have these freedoms is directly, let me repeat, we have these freedoms. We take them for granted is directly due to the women's movement. Because as Ghana, and the, you know, the thing is that there was some, there was a lot of political, um, because of how independence came about, and even the different sides to the whole independent argument, people were political. But the fact is the trade unions were strong in Ghana. There was a lot of stuff that, that in terms of political awareness 
wasn't isn't uh, isn't uh, is sort of missing now. But let's let's be clear that the women's movement did not subsume their struggle to the wider political struggle in Ghana. It charted its own course. The thing with the market women, with farmers, it's not it's just not possible to talk about. So it's not even an issue of inspiration. It's beyond inspiration. This is about how we are living. This is about how we live, how we, I mean, maternity leave. Um, it's about everything. It's not even inspiration, like it's not possible. I guess it's, it, it's beyond, I mean, so when we talk about, I mean, the, uh, what, what Auntie Hillary spoke about and, and, and always uh, being sure they understood, as I think we've lost sight a bit now, they understood that we can't wait for culture to change. That giving freedom to women is an interventionist approach that has, been, has to be backed by law and policy and money and funding and active active work. So um, um and, and that's important because people can say anything to women, you know, they can say bide your time, whatever, 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 whatever. If it's backed by law, if funds are given, if institutions are made possible, if freedom is granted, that's where that's how we get free. We don't get free by you know culture being changing. The culture then changes and follows up. So they are everything to us. They continue to be everything to us. Thank you. Thank you so much, Kina. And I can I can feel the passion in the way you're saying, and, and I think you're so right. I mean, there's so much that we take for granted. Um, and I think it, for me, this, this film was really a reminder that all these things that we think are just normal, uh, as you said, it takes an intervention and often it takes a fight uh, to, for us to acquire it. And, and we talk in the, late, the second part of the, um, <clears throat> of, the, of the webinar about how it also takes a fight to keep it because uh, sometimes uh, it's, it can be uh, what we think we're taking for granted can be snatched and we've seen that time and time again. Thank you so much. Let me turn to you, uh, Pumla. Uh, and uh, uh, thank you, yeah, okay, you're still here. I was looking for you. Thank you so much uh, again for being with us. And I, I wanted to ask you, as I said earlier, with your perspective as a South African uh, feminist, but also, as you said earlier, somebody who's very actively part of the African, Pan-African feminist movement. How does, um, I was thinking earlier like, to ask what is something that is very similar, that really resonates as something that's very similar to you and something, so you've said a little bit about that earlier, but if you want to expand on similarities and how it expands for you, uh, what you are looking at from your perspective. Thank you, Francoise. I think that um, th th there are many similarities. And I think these similarities are important um, for the work we can do. I think that it, 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 it's, I like what you said at the very beginning, that um, as African feminists working today in wherever we work, it's, it's, it's it's important to remember whose shoulders we stand on, to remember whose, you know, whose lineage, whose chosen um, kind of traditions we are, we are, we are working in. Um, and, and not to constantly, and not to be exhausted also, I think by the constant distraction about the way we have to justify ourselves so much, so often. So we all know that it's, it's, it's there is no historical, basis to the idea that African feminism is new, um, African feminisms are new, that radical women on this continent are new. We know this, but I think that so often we, we sometimes allow ourselves to be exhausted by this distraction as though we don't know what it's for, as though we don't know that that's exactly why they say it, that we may be trying to prove it, but the people accusing us of this, they don't really believe it themselves. But they know that we're, for as long as we're busy justifying ourselves, we're not doing what we really want to do. And so that's the first, that's the first similarity with that. that and that's the very first important thing about, about this film for me is that it is absolutely unapologetic about, about that long history of women's organizing. And it's interesting that very often it's not only conservative people in our own African context who accuse us of feminism being new, but often if we think about how feminism is mapped onto the globe, right? The dominant narrative about, about waves 
um, you know, first wave, second wave, third wave. So African women are always in the third wave. What are this nonsense about? If you talk about feminism in the world, you have to talk about these waves. And of course, one of the things is that if you actually pay attention to African women, radical African women's organizing in different places, certainly this film draws it to the forefront so much for us. What we see is the lie in that, right? Is the, is, is, is the long layered, complicated ways in which women have kind of built and, and, and recrafted again and again and again and again um, and, and, and African, women, African women's movements, Ghanaian women's, women's movements. So I think the first similarity is that it, 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 it traces that long history and we're able to see concretely, as I think we do when we look at Cameroon and sometimes when we look at you know, different places, the, the, the particular manifestations are different, right? So I mean, in South Africa, very often um, people talk about, I mean, what they like to do now when they try to shut up um, African feminists is they say something like, Oh no, but this is so liberal. And in South Africa, of course, the word liberalism is an insult if you're on the left, right? So whereas the whole world thinks of, kind of liberal as progressive, um, in South Africa, it has this kind of weird history where kind of the word liberal means a very kind of centrist um, um, kind of tr tradition. And so there's this missile of not only are you new, but you're articulating this thing that is, that is, that is. And I think what films like this, what this particular film does, which is important, um, and which bears similarities is that in fact, we're able to plot very beautifully along this timeline that says, excuse me, look at what Af radical women, African women were saying in their own name in the, in the, in the, in the, in the forties, in the fifties, in the, in the sixties. So you can't, if I'm coming and with, if, 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 if as a Ghanaian feminist, as a South African feminist, as a Cameroonian feminist, as an African feminist located anywhere on this continent, I'm standing in a tradition that's more than a that's almost a century old. I don't, don't waste my time, right? So I think it makes that argument so much stronger than, than our constant saying, no, 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 but really, no, 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 but really. And I think the great thing about film, of course, is that it does this, like you don't need to have feminism 101 to be able to understand what this film's doing. You don't need to be in a course, it, it, you know, films are able to kind of travel and do this work so powerfully for us. I think the second, so I think the, the, the first thing is that, you know, the long history of women's organizing, unapologetic and speaks very clearly about, and I think the integration of different kinds of historical texts uh, is woven into these, 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 the, 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 these feminists' um, own words is very helpful in this regard. And I think it also illustrates something that I think in South Africa we needs to be stated again and again and again, I think in Ghana and I think, you know, in Kenya and I think, you know, wherever we are, how women's movements work gets erased, right? So it doesn't target, it doesn't address itself to that too much, but it speaks to it, even if obliquely. And part of that, of course, is that, um, it is part of what I love about this film, is, is, is the way in which it says, well, you know what? It's not only a map of, 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 of African, of, of Ghanaian women's um, political action and organizing and the ways they've shaped institutions, but actually the big argument, if, if films can be made, said to make an argument, the big argument of the film is you cannot think about Ghanaian anything without thinking about the ways in which you cannot think about Ghanaian law. You cannot think about the court system. You cannot think about parliamentary politics. You cannot think about the economy. You cannot think about the psyche. You cannot think about any aspect of contemporary Ghanaian life or institutional institution without thinking of the roles that women played in creating and crafting that, 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 that. And, and this comes across, you know, incredibly clearly. And of course, um, and, and I think that's something that 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 um, that that I think many of us could 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 learn could learn from um, this insistence. Not not only not just say we're not new, but saying excuse me, can you think about you able to do certain things and own certain things? Like Kina was saying, have your own passport. Um, it didn't just happen, right? And I think the differences which I you know got very animated about, as if I'm not animated enough about the similarities. Uh, watching this film, of course, is that, oh, there was a little bit of me that was like envious, right? Um, because one of the things that the Ghanaian women's movement in its different forms, 
in in the disagreements and certainly the, the film shows that you know people weren't always um, you know difference is an important thing in any movement right it's not it, it doesn't shy away from it too much um, but one of the things of course about um, sheer accident of history maybe um, and doing radical work in differently kind of configured historical epochs is that I, I, was, I, I was very excited and energized and saddened, only saddened for myself, but happy for Ghanaian feminists, um, about the ways in which that the Ghanaian women's movement has not allowed itself to be sucked into um, a whole range of other totalizing kinds of movements. So for example, what we see often in, in, so although we can kind of say, oh, this is what the first kind of black women's federation of African women or whatever, and we can see all these things, oh, this is what happens in the fifties, da, da, da. but what we often see in the South African and Southern African context is the way in which women's organizing gets absorbed first into kind of nationalist um, agendas where, that, where, where, where then it kind of become, become subsumed under kind of nationalist organizations as though this is the only way you can tell it. And, 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 the, and, and, and the ways in which very quickly at different epochs over and over again, women surrender the capacity to organize across political parties. And so almost every decade, someone comes along and says, no, 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 let's, let's, let's reorganize across the decade, across the different political parties and across politics again, let's do it again. Um, and then of course, of course, people get pulled into their political parties and they pull and they, professional bodies and, 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 and so I was really, one of the things, the big difference is the way in which they, you, okay, Ghanaian women and feminists have, have, have really been able to successfully retain um, a presence or presences um, autonomously, um, even, if, even if it's not one long line, but that it, 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 it wasn't, I mean, it's not that frustrating Southern African thing where it's like, Oh, they've disappeared. Okay, let's redo it. Okay, let's do the national coalition. Okay, let's do another federation, which, which also I think in our case is, a, is, is deeply implicated in why we can't find radical women because people just say, oh, she was an ANC woman. And then it's easy to dismiss that even if that person was a founder or something else that was something else and worked across. Um, so yes, I mean, I could go on forever, but I, I, I want to hear from my other sisters, so I'm going to Yes, stop. absolutely, absolutely. Thank you so much. And I, I think it's, it's really interesting that difference that you're, you're explaining. And it makes me think about how, how we, or not only we need a when women speak for like so many different countries, but we also need them to come in conversation together so we can have that. So I'm, I'm, very, I'm being very excited about the prospect of something like that at some point. Um, thank you so much uh, for sharing that. You know, uh, we're a little behind time, which is not surprising because it's such an interesting conversation. But I, I did want to show uh, another uh, snippet of the movie, which is the last 10 minutes or so of the movie, because it shows a little bit about the transitions between that and uh, what, comes, uh, what comes next for the movement. So if um, Lydia and the comms team, you want to show that, and then uh, we'll have to maybe shorten a little bit uh, of the, the later part of the conversation so that we have time for discussion with the audience. But I think it's quite important to show it still. So please go ahead, Lydia. Currently, I think it's done. And it's a challenge for all of us who are interested in gender issues. There are these deep-seated um, issues of gender inequalities, which are not amenable to quick solution. So whilst the world looks different from my time, the challenges are no less heavy. Sometimes I feel that there is some retrogression in terms of uh, how younger people even see the whole, you know, women's rights. Some younger people don't see that there is an issue. That really saddens me, that they don't have uh, uh, the ability to even recognize their potentials. And some of them are so good that they are afraid of the men. We cannot talk to the next or with the next generation easily. There is uh, an easy calm 
we, we need that uh, intergenerational dialogue, handover, uh, working together, and so on, so that our movement becomes a multi-generational movement, as opposed to an old movement, which requires that younger feminists build new movements to, to prosecute struggles. I would urge them to learn a little more about our history, what has going on, gone on before. I would urge them to take a broader interest in issues of economic policy and justice. At least you need to inform yourself about some of those kinds of things and not to be able to say that you are not interested in issues of rural women or urban women or something like that, because it, it may look distant from you, but the more you connect your own struggles, because we talk about intersectionality and it should mean something. I would say to a younger generation that um, we, we did some things, we failed to achieve many things, and we've left them um, a burdensome legacy. Every generation is given its task. If we don't build on what has been done, we always reinvent the wheel. We will always believe that our generation invented uh, the feminist movement. Our feminism is superior to that of older generations. And so we are the ones coming to start all over again. And why start when they are, they are shoulders to stand on? I think there's a larger project that we as feminists and women's rights, um, women's rights activists must be concerned about, and it's about how we build a society that we can be proud of. I think there's too much inequality in the system for us to focus on ourselves alone. If you look at um, recent struggles that we all have admired, like the Sudanese struggle against uh, dictatorship, even the Feast Mass Fall movement in, in South Africa, you see that a lot of young women led where they were leading members of, of, of these struggles, and played a very pivotal role. And although they were aided by social media, the real struggle took place on the ground. So it means that whatever we do, we will continue to organize, need to organize in traditional ways and also in new ways. Thank you so much, Lydia. <clears throat> Thank you. I was hoping we, we would have time to also look at everybody's name, but in the interest of time, um, uh, it's, uh, unfortunately, we won't be able to do so. But I am so taken by two things in this uh, short clip. One is uh, the link to uh, like, this is about a society that we want to build. It's not only about our individual lives. I think that was something that really resonated with me. And also this question of why start over uh, when we have stories to, to, to stand on. So thank you, Lydia, for, for sharing this. And I think it's such a powerful uh, note to, to end the film on and also for us to continue the conversation. So we don't have much as much time as I was hoping, but I still wanted to... Um, to ask about that, uh, making the link to the future uh, of uh, our struggle as feminists and our movement as well. And I, so the, the next round of questions I'm going to ask is going to be about that. And maybe, <clears throat> maybe uh, I, I will make it a bit, I ask you all to be a little bit uh, shorter and I'm hoping that we can find other ways to continue uh, the conversation. I'm thinking, actually, I'm going to ask one question and I'm, ask, I'm going to ask you all to contribute to it from your own perspective, but in the interest of time. And that question is about um, this, this, these links, the link to the, um, the new, the, the kind of intergenerational link on one hand uh, in the film and in a, uh, and in a contributions earlier, Hillary was telling us about making the link to the global context and back to our, our local context. So all of those links, um, I'm very interested about because it's, I feel like this is teaching us that the links are what allow us to build and to, to really do stand firmly on those, uh, um, 
on those on those uh, strong shoulders. So the question I have for you all is, what are the linkages that you think needs we all need to make in whatever links that you think are important to highlight, and links uh, in terms of uh, passing to the, the next generation could be passing uh, to the global context, whatever you, you think. But if you can tell us what you think about those links and what is uh, the main action that we can take or we could take as a, as a movement and maybe also what challenges we might face in doing so. Um, so it's one volunt like <laughs> purposefully kind of vague question to allow all of you to come in. Uh, but I hope it's clear enough. Let me know if it's not. And maybe I can start with you, Kina. Um, yeah. Um, I loved what Pumla said in the beginning about archives and this thing about doing everything over again. Um, because that is essential to the whole intergenerational conversation every single time, not only for the feminist movement, but really the direction that Africa will go. It's almost as though everything, you know, I hate the word innovation. <laughs> it's like every single answer to our problem should be, I hate it. I don't want to see it anymore. So of course, sometimes, because we have to understand that, you know, the only, there's no good thing about oppressive systems. But one of the things about oppressive systems is that the way it manifests, the tenants, they never change. So it's like oppressive systems and how it enacts on uh, um, um, people, it ne that never changes. But if the people who are oppressed are always thinking, like James Baldwin said, you think your pain is unprecedented in the history of the world, and then you read. Part of this is the hubris of youth. Part of this is this business of always dislocating us from what, and, 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 and like the, Deracinating us from what Africans have done in the past and always minimizing that. Um, Professor Amina Mama in her, in her, when she was in, um, in, I think it's called an investiture, the Kwame Nkrumah chair, she was talking about this issue that really our archives are uniquely ours. And that's where we should look to. Nobody else's archives. If somebody else's archives have something for you, well, that's just wonderful. And that's how the universe works. But it is actually, let me be brutal, incumbent upon the young people to actually look for these archives. Because you know what? Mrs. Anit Yage, she's dead. She's gone. A lot of them are dead. And some of them are going to die. There's death and dying. If you, it is not incumbent upon you, if you insist upon looking upon the lives of women that have come before you, looking at your mother's lives and thinking, well, they did not uh, struggle. I am new. You are just going to waste time. And that is what we tend to do. We waste time with the hubris of youth and not understanding about archives. So actually this film and the fact that these women sat down to talk about this, of course they care. They are, this is their struggle. The women, the feminists in the older generation, they care, they are concerned, but they didn't have to. It is incumbent upon young people to go looking because you cannot live in a world where you have assumed nobody struggled before you got here. Because at the very least, well, we struggled against colonialism. Like how did we become, I mean, think. Think and appreciate. Just because we have mothers, you know, people have this thing where they look at their mothers and go, well, you know, she cooked in the, in the kitchen and that was so. Are you kidding me? Are you kidding me? Our mothers, prevail. They are, you know, people. Ah. So that's the first thing. It is incumbent upon young people. Otherwise, we are wasting time. I don't like to waste time. You know, she's, um, Pumla said it perfectly, you know, if people have come and they have struggled, even in what, when my mother, when I go to a meeting and I start to speak and the men, they don't want to listen to me. I just remember what my mother used to say about being a minister, being in a cabinet meeting. And when she started to speak, that's when the men will start to smoke, scratch their balls, call their girlfriends. I do, therefore, I know I do not seek audience with men because my mother has already struggled and told me that. So what are you going to do? Start everything over and over and over 
that is not how movements are built. So the thing is that there is this argument, there's this thing going on in Ghana here where it has almost become like the older feminists have to prove themselves. They do not need to prove a damn thing, but thank you, Professor Akosia, for this movie. <laughs> they don't need to prove a damn thing. It's your life now. What you need to ask yourself is, and I'm sorry, there's been no failure and I refuse to accept um, Georgie's thing about the, 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 the thing being burdensome. Nothing is burdensome. They have done exactly what they were supposed to do with what they have. And now we should take it forward. And so it's, it's, it, there be no, we can look at some of what they said and, and critique and go, how can we do better? But, but really, look, oppressive systems don't change. And so don't think that you are new and shiny. You're not new and shiny. Nobody is new and shiny. <laughs> Nobody is new and shiny. We are just, we are just, we are just a new version. We are just not the new generation, but we don't know any better. Mm. You get to know, and you get to know better by I sit down and ask the people who have come before you. How does this law pass? Because right now, how can we do such and things? What does it this mean? Why do we need the policy? Why do we need the law? Why, in spite of all of this, are Ghanaian women and the siege? What look? This is it. So I, I I sit in a lot of these conversations where it appears as though the older women need to justify themselves. I think not. You want you if you want to make your it because it is your responsibility. They've handed you something, and it's your responsibility to acknowledge what they, they their struggles because you do not want to waste anybody's words. People do not write things, make movies, and uh, much so that you will come and waste their time. Because if you waste the, the, their efforts, your life isn't going to get any better. You're not going to prevail. Yeah. So that 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 you know and and. Things are just, you know, there was a time there were no newspapers. When newspapers came, people said the world was changing. So what is social media? It's just the newest uh, thing to come. And there it, will it, be the world day. is likely the same. Oh, it's the yeah. same. <laughs> 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 like Thank you so much, Kida. Thank you. It's, it's, uh, it's very powerful what you're saying about um, this sense of urgency. Uh, I agree. We don't have time to waste uh, because the oppression is still very very much there and very urgently affecting our lives so we don't have time to waste indeed um let me let me turn to you uh, hillary uh, I, I i would love to have your take on this question as well in terms of the links and uh, okay. that needs to, that that need to be made looking forward Thank, thank you very much. And I want to thank uh, Kina for that uh, impassioned uh, uh, contribution. Uh, thank you so much, Kina. And I endorse uh, 99 point something percent of uh, what you said. I'll, I'll keep the other point something as I move around, uh, as, I, I, as I move forward. Thank you. Thank you so much. I, I like your last statement that we must sit down and ask questions and talk. Because um, the first link should be, the first intergenerational link should be the communication link. And it has broken down in many ways. Uh, we don't talk to one another. We don't talk with one another. And I think this must be our starting point. And I thank a a ADWF for uh, the initiatives you have made in our intergenerational dialogue. We must have in which we look at what I call compulsory subjects that we must we we must talk about the ideologies, the philosophies, the grounding of feminism, women's rights, and so on. This we cannot go off on different tangents on this fundamental. We must know what equality is, and this must run throughout the ages. We can also have unstructured dialogues in, in the sense that we collaborate in doing things together so that the shared experience is passed on without it being looked at as patronizing or, or, or you know, or, or paternalistic or whatever we want. I'm showing you how. And I think that we should be engaged in more work together. There is a very interesting phenomenon in some secondary schools in Ghana now, and I love it. 
it is that when they are celebrating their honors day, a year that has graduated maybe 30 years before takes the lead. It conscripts a year that has graduated 10 years before. So they are the young ones to whom the intergenerational uh, uh, baton is being passed. And also in the background advising are those who left 50 years before. This is the kind of uh, uh, model that we should also adopt in our dialogues. Then we, we must also accept that there are new ways, uh, Kina spoke about them, of, uh, of communicating social media and so on. And that resonates uh, probably better with the younger generation than with people like us. Let's find a common ground, respect, and so on. The other area which came out in the film is the contemporary issues. Professor Techua Men talked about economic policy, justice, and so on. But there are issues around even the social media and the violence, the new forms of violence, the porn revenge, the uh, sextortion, and the technologically mediated rapes. These are issues we must unpack and be comfortable with speaking about difficult subjects. And the only, the only regret I have about this film is that a very difficult area I, I spoke on, sexual and reproductive health and uh, comprehensive sexuality education did not make it into the film. We need to talk about the uncomfortable and taboo subjects, but maybe in the next round with the next generation. Finally, we must listen to the contestations. The younger generation say, uh, we the older one, we are patronizing, we keep asking them, where were you when this was done? We are not reaching out. We are living in a dinosaurial world of our own. Uh, yes, that is life. The difference is democracy. They also uh, must, we must have some kind of reaching out and a common platform in which we can have a no, Holds bad conversation, bare knuckled conversation, out of which we come out stronger and richer. Thank you. Thank you so much. <clears throat> I'm taking away uh, one of the things that really I find really striking. What you're saying is how conversation needs to be. Uh, you said uh, no, no. Uh, Holds bad. No holds bad. Bad. Sorry. Yes, no holds yes, bad. Exactly. <laughs> I think I think that is the thing. Like to be able to have those conversations. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. uh, sometimes they're structured, sometimes they're not, um, yeah. but they always need to be true and truthful. Yes. And, and sometimes, you know, it's, it, those are very hard conversations, um, but they do, they, they do need to happen in a way that is, you know, infused or, or the values of sisterhood, etc. And that is, it just sounds easy and it's ne it never is, and we need to keep trying. So thank you so much for, for, for raising that, really appreciate that. Um, Next, uh, Asaye, do you want to also uh, share your take about, about this? And maybe I will ask you to think about what is the future as well uh, for this kind of project or this project in particular, you think about the links looking forward. Okay, so for me, I think the links, uh, the, the film itself is, is an entry to this conversation about intergenerational discourse uh, on, on the movement and also meeting each other in between. Um, for, for people like me who also are into activism, activism also, but are also artists, et cetera, I think that um, we have a responsibility towards the movements and our own country and society and Af Africa and the world at large to continue to do work in this area in various forms, you know? Because uh, for us, film cannot be entertainment alone. Um, when we are making the, the bread and butter entertainment, we should also consistently consider that there, we are of a certain gender and that in, in the world, we are still on a certain battlefield. And as the battle continues, we should use all mediums we have. So for me, if it's film, Consistently, we should be making stories about our work, our progress, uh, some history, because uh, of, I mean, women have already been written out of history. I keep saying that even in my own area of film, internationally, when you read the film history textbooks, etc., 
half pages are given to even white women. <laughs> so you can imagine where we stand as black women. Nothing at all almost exists. And, 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 and even the men, women who were making films before men are almost silent. You know, everybody speaks of this great American filmmaker called D.W. Griffith. Well, there was a woman called Alice Guy Blachet making film. So even if on that space, it's like that, then we should, we who are in this area should know that we cannot go to sleep, that whatever means we have to, whether it is highly funded or not, different stories about Ghanaian women, African women, the movements, their achievements, even if there were failures, we need to document all of these things, especially where we are, we are also losing a lot of things easily because of time, because of technology, we claim to be in a very technologically advanced world, but rather we are losing a lot more information now than before because you know we trust our phones and we trust mm -hmm. our laptops and when they crash that's the end. And so you lose all your archives, your photos, but when we, we consistently document these things and make them available because like Prof. Dumaco has always said, it's not very easy for people to go to go and read the journals, but because we have become very visual, if it's there, people watch and they are, even if they watch it in bits, they'll be oh, so this happened. And so then there'll be not be the need to want to create new movements if we are honest. Yes, um, young people are very anti-history, which is really not right. Um, we will try to make it attractive to them, but we can also overly spoon feed them and baby them too much. So we all need to meet each other halfway somehow. And so for me, the, the, this film is a link. If we we can make, I mean, we have so much footage from this film that we can make it in about uh, a six serial or five serial, you know. So if there's a chance to do a lot more with what we have left, we will try to do that. I also think that because of this entry of this film, people can also pick it bank on this and come up with other ideas, you know, because there are many other more women and other movements and other situations and other stories that haven't been told. And so they can also make the move and try to, 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 to tell these stories and archive these moments so that um, younger, film, younger feminists will understand where we have come from because it's always better to have an understanding of the past. And so we do better with the future or else we, re, we, we risk reinventing and sometimes in the reinventing, we actually lose focus. So for me as an artist, my work is not done and so probably I enter the grave. And even when I'm in the grave, there should be still things that have been left to show that work is still, is still ongoing, you know? And so the, 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 the links keep, will keep coming here and there depending on who is doing what, but we should not break the chain. We should never take for granted what has been done in the past you know, because those are what will give us the links to what we can progress with in the future as well. And so the work, the work is not done. Uh, it would be great if we could dab this film, one, into a number of Ghanaian languages, two, at least in the French language, because that's our immediate neighbors. If they can have access, I think it would be good for Africa to experience this film. So for those who feel like, oh, they haven't done much, they'll feel like we have also done something in our country, maybe we could replicate this because um, like Kina said, there's nothing like innovation. People have done things before us, we're just building on it. So if we, if we share this, people should be confident enough to also want to share their stories. And probably when our other stories are shared, younger feminists in Ghana, in Africa will realize that, oh, um, there's, there's something that has happened all throughout and we can all fall on this and build bigger, greater uh, and, and multi-generational movements like Professor Chikata has said. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Asaye. And uh, before I turn to Pumla, uh, I think this might be a good moment to ask you, uh, uh, Kate, uh, if you can also expand on like the future of this this project from your perspective. What are the? How can this uh, project expand to address some of those those linkages that need to be made? Yeah. Um, so we're definitely keen for the film to be used and taken up and it's really great that AWDF have kind of started this ball rolling with us and we've also um, had some workshops organised with Abantu to take this film out of the capital city. We had a regional workshop in Ho 
So we invited to that district assembly women, um, people from the political parties active in the area, a parliamentarian came to watch it, um, some representatives of women's groups, church groups, and so on. So when we did that regional workshop, it was sort of a bit of an experiment to see whether we could have a regional program that would enable the film to perhaps have a nationwide reach if we could repeat these kind of workshops in other capital cities. So that's kind of one strand is sort of, if you like, geographically taking the film out. Um, almost all the events we've done, people have raised the question of dubbing. And um, it is something that we would really like to see. But it's obviously a very expensive, it's quite, um, it's quite a major endeavor. It's not a small or straightforward job. Work about use of this film in the classroom. Um, so we've designed a teach sheet um, which goes with the film for people to use. You could start with SHS, certainly undergraduate level upwards. Um, so we're hoping that the film will be used um, as a teaching aid and that would help for the film to reach the lots of younger women. So we've done some of that work, but I'm also thinking particularly about um, groups like Abantu and others in Ghana, which do work, if you like, closer to the grassroots um, sort of people in the district. Sarika, do you mind going off video because your, your sound is getting a bit distorted? Um, the district level. Okay, so. Ah, the beauty of Zoom. I'm so sorry, I think we are losing Kate. Ah, I, sorry, we couldn't hear for, for the last few seconds. Uh, so maybe you want to go off video to finish your sentence? Ah, okay. So, yeah. no, don't, don't worry. Let's not worry about that. And we can we can add more if we find the time towards the end. Um, but thank you so much for sharing. I think um, there's a few questions uh, in the uh, in the chat about where do we find the film? When is the next show? So maybe I say if you don't mind addressing that in the chat box to give everybody a sense, and we'll also make sure to bring that information uh, forward in the. Uh, in, in our, on our social media um, and to amplify that. So, but if you have the answer, I say, could you please add that to the, to the chat? Um, Umla, I'm turning to you. Sure, uh, to, I will. Thank you so much, I say. Umla, I'm turning to you um, just to ask also, like from your perspective, perspectives, because you've shown us how many you have, is there something that you want to contribute to in terms of the links that, the linkages that need to be made? as we, we near, we near the, the closing of the conversation. Yes, absolutely. I mean, I, I think that um, uh, Gina talks about hating the word innovation. Me too, Gina, me too. South Africans love that word too much. And the funny thing for me also listening um, and trying to listen very carefully to the conversations that are happening within the women's movement in, 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 in Ghana is how often the word intergenerational conversation is coming up which is another word that I'm starting to dislike in South Africa because you can't get away from intergenerational, the mention of intergenerational conversation. Um, and yet very often the intergenerational conversation, the, only the feminists are having the intergenerational conversations, right? It's not it's like this, this call for an intergenerational conversation is not something that other people are doing um, at all. But I worry also that often some of the links are missing from maybe not in the West African context, or certainly in the South African and Namibian context, a lot of the links that are missing around intergenerational conversation are, you know, as, as, as Agosua said in the, in, 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 the, in, in the chats as well, that it has, to be a, a, it has to be an actual conversation in both directions. And I think that there's so much um, to learn from, from and, and an intergenerational conversation is not the place where younger, more energetic, um, feminists come and, and, and kind of correct and, 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 and make arguments and claims about, 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 you know, about being more radical. And I think that one of the links that, 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 that are important to make then are links around, you know, this, the generation of, 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 of Ghanaian 
um, radical women that we have just watched in this film. Like many of their generation in other African contexts, were very clear about the system and the structures that they needed to target their work towards, right? And so I think that part of what we are seeing less and less of um, in contemporary feminisms, and especially in contemporary feminisms that are making claims to, this is the US most radical most, is, 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 is the loss of that link that was very clear to the generation of feminists that we see in this film. The first, of one, the first one is the sense of, well, actually you do have much to learn from previous generations. The second one is feminism, your feminism always has to be about more than yourself, right? Which is, I think is the point. It always has to be, it has, you, you can never take yourself out of it, but it always has to be about more than yourself. And it always has to be about the structure because I think that the, the fundamental lesson that the women who's, um, Whose, 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 whose fantastic tradition we inherit um, taught us is that let's not take the eye off the structure of institution, of system. And I think very often we, and of course to do that, when you, can, when, you, when you keep your eye on structure, on system, on institution, you recognize that you have to organize. You have to do work um, that, that, you know, you, you have to organize across difference as well. Right, I think that so. I think those are the links that 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 are important to kind of bring back into as we. And I think the other the other thing um, link the other thing that I think that that, that many contemporary feminisms um, um, or newer feminisms um, are losing, of course, is 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 just how expansive um, this vision is, right? That we're starting to see, we're having conversations that are important across these bothersome, cumbersome nationalist boundaries. And I'm, and I'm often worried that there's so much of a retreat to nationalist um, kind of feminist um, um, coalition, which isn't necessarily um, organizing. And so I think one of the lessons that we can learn, what can, that this film um, reminds us to continue to make linkages across um, um, across spaces, across different generations, also to recognize that movements, it's not a movement if we all agree on exactly this, everything 100% of the time. It's only a movement if we actually have a way of dealing with difference that is productive, that is interesting, that is feminist. And I think very, I think that's, that's a lot of that is lost. Um, and I think that part of the future, what I would like to do and like to see with this, film in its futures when it's available and I'll be first in line to get copies uh, in whatever format the filmmakers decide is that I'm thinking that I would love nothing more than to have I don't know because I teach so I'll say in terms of the teaching um, just um, to have this film and a discussion um, or in, in a teaching context this film and another film that's very similar in spirit I think by the feminist filmmaker which is actually called standing on their shoulders which, which, which does a similar kind of plotting of kind of multi-generational kind of interviewing activists and thinking about radical women in different generations across different movements in the history of, 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 um, of, 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 of South Africa. So I'd like, I, you know, so, I, so, so I'm hoping that I'm not just arguing for, 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 for highlighting many of those linkages that, um, but that I'm also in it, you know, that, that, I, that I'm also part of kind of highlighting those um, that we all are part of highlighting um, some of those linkages that I think are important. Um, if feminism is gonna to continue to do the work that it has done, and if we're going to continue um, to be deserving, to be honest, of the great legacy um, we, you know, we, stand, we stand in. And then the last thing, which is my big bugbear, I'm sorry. This film reminds us that not just about how fabulous the Ghanaian women's movement is, but also of Ghana, Ghanaian um, feminist contributions to the global language of gender equality, of feminism. And I think that's important. And I think that's something we need to constantly um, kind of shine a light on, um, not defensively, but in precisely the way that this film does it, because I think that um, not as a response to us being new, 
But just a reminder too, you know, because I don't know where people think all this, all these kind of frameworks globally come from everywhere except Africa and we, and, and we inherit them. And I think, so I think those linkages are really, really, really important to say, no, I'm sorry, but this is the contribution. You are all in the US finally catching up and realizing this, but Ghanaian women taught you this thing in the sixties. Can you just like have perspective with your waves? Yes, <laughs> yes. That's such, a, that's such a strong point to end on. Thank you so much, Kumlai. I think it's very important. You know, I know we're a little at time and we have a couple of questions. And if you do have questions that you haven't asked in the chat, this, this is the moment because we'll turn to them next. But before we do that, um, as I, we were going in the conversation, I was thinking um, uh, that it would be great to get a, a younger, younger, younger uh, Ghanaian feminist uh, to share their own takeaways uh, from both the film and this conversation. And uh, um, I was thinking, you know, where we have a lot of fantastic young African and Ghanaian feminists is the AWDF team. So welcome to Malaika, who's part of our team. Do you want to introduce yourself, uh, Malaika, and say a little bit about your takeaways and just go for it. Uh, unfortunately, we don't have a lot of time, but I would love to hear from you. Welcome, Malaika. Thank you so much, Francoise, for inviting me. Thank you to um, all the panelists for this conversation. I hope you can hear me. I'm not too sure. Okay, great. So thank you. So my name is Malaika Iboy. Um, I'm a young um, Ghanaian and African feminist. I work at AWDF and also contribute to the movement um, with different young, vibrant feminists um, in the space. So I would um, want to begin by thanking Say so much for this film um, and Dr. Skinner and um, Professor Adumat um, Popo. I think um, I watched the screening at the theater and um, something that I really loved was how much it felt like women just sharing their stories to other women um, and kind of inviting us almost like aunties um, to come and listen to the work that they've done, to all the things that they've accomplished that we now get to take for granted. And I think sometimes it's a good thing when you're able to take for granted that you can have a passport because it should really be very basic. <laughs> um, but obviously we stand on those um, shoulders and it's really great to watch um, and to, to be invited to listen in a, in a way that felt um, warm and that felt loving and with anecdotes and all of that. Um, I really loved that. And another thing that I really loved from the screening itself is when um, Asai and the team let us know that they've been screening this film in high schools. I think that's a very crucial and important part of this project is that um, young people and girls are being invited, sorry about this, are being invited to learn and are being invited to um, know their history and know where we all come from and, and um, the work that has gone on and the work that they feel still needs to to go on so I really loved all of those um, aspects of the film and a lot of the comments here today resonated with me as well um, while I watched it um, and the snippets that we saw today I want to respond to some of the um, last bits of the film and also this conversation um, about younger feminists and um, Maybe the, the women's movement being seen as a little bit down now, or that we as young feminists might not be cognizant of um, the need for fighting for women's rights or um, not aware of some of the things that have already happened. And I think to an extent it's true, but I also think that to an extent I sitting here as a young feminist felt unfairly represented or like um, pictured in a very the picture I couldn't relate to the picture so I myself I'm a, I'm a lover of history I read about how you know the women's manifesto came about the 31st women's movement like I've read and I read some of the people on this um, panel and I am always thinking about history informs about how history informs our everyday lives and I think I would never disrespect like my mother and say you know she didn't know what she was doing in the 80s or the 90s. I think she's one of my biggest inspirations. And I feel it's, um, I don't know, I think it's an unfair picture. And I think it does not represent the young feminists that I know accurately at all. <laughs> um, and I also would say that 
you know, if you put your, yourself in my shoes listening to this conversation, and if any of the attendees were young Ghanaian feminists, they would feel a little bit alienated from the space because it feels like we have to come into it defending ourselves already. And I personally have never, you know, kind of felt like, oh, I'm better than those feminists or we're more rad radical and all of those things. So I did have to like say that. Um, but I also want to talk about the question that Francoise um, posed about the linkages, um, like moving forward and all. I think something that um, Dr. Pumla said that I really resonate with is that a movement needs difference. Um, and I think it came up from different panelists as well. Um, and sometimes that difference, um, especially for younger feminists, is almost seen as like dismissed in a way. So for instance, I could, if I think about the feminists that really inspire me, the young ones um, in Ghana who are doing work on sexual and reproductive health rights and consent culture and sexual harassment and creating spaces and conversations for people to feel sexually liberated and to understand their sexual autonomy, I feel like those are very important parts of the movement. Um, it might be different from organizing for bills um, or for legislation, but it's no less important. Um, and I think we would benefit as a whole if we didn't look at it as, you know, versus, like, we're not fighting, right? Like it's not, um, it's not a fight for me personally and for most of the feminists that I know. Um, and um, I'll just end with like a small, you know, so last year, for instance, um, the anti-LGBT bill that was proposed in parliament was a huge um, point of organizing for young feminists um, in, in that country. Um, and also through the online space, I think today feminism and activism can look very different and we're able to organize across borders. And so we're able to galvanize support from other, you know, um, corners of the continent. But I think in a conversation with a brilliant colleague and friend, Karen, also on the AWDF team, we were just thinking, what would it have looked like if the older generation, instead of perhaps um, not aligning with that priority of queer rights, was to say, hey, we're part of this struggle. Don't pass the anti-LGBT bill, pass the affirmative action bill. What if we had like a united front um, and we're able to integrate all our different priorities, all our different approaches, all our different, um, yeah, issues that we want to center in our work instead of seeing them as in opposition. Um, and I, yeah, and I, I mean, I am saddened by any of the feelings from older generations that we might dismiss their work or think that they're not radical because I personally do not feel like that at all. And, um, you know, my feminist friends, don't eat that. So I think I'll just stop here so that there's still a few more minutes for questions. But thank you, Pontoise. Thank you so much, Malika, for sharing. And I think it's I think I'm glad you you did right. share uh, and uh, and you didn't hold back. And I'm glad you didn't do that because I think that um, we're talking, I think Hillary was telling us like the conversations need to be real, right? To be transformative. And so I think. I'm just thinking now about, ah, oh, we only have a few Absolutely. minutes. How do we, <laughs> how we, we can't take this forward here, but I think this is the kind Absolutely. of conversation that we want to take. And I think it would be, it would have been a mistake for us to not have your voice. And I'm so grateful that you decided to share with us. So I'm thinking, how do we continue this, this conversation moving forward? And this is a great starting point. I don't think it's a starting point per se, because it, it has been many, many, uh, ideations of this conversation but this is the conversation i think there's so much to learn i uh, um there's only one question that we got uh from the comments and uh, from the chat so i think uh, because we are at time i'm going to read one uh that came so we've answered some of the questions about like what's next with the movie what can we watch the movie etc there was a, a question by um dr toin ajao uh, whom uh, we call uh, moon goddess uh, in Nigeria, who asked, um, who said, thank you for sharing your inspiring journeys. When women's victim, how can feminist activism in Africa be an import when some of us have to start breaking the bias of attached, that are attached to our arriving in this world from the cradle? Solidarity forever. Um, I think it's like, it's only one of question. We mostly have comments 
And so I'm just, I'm just sharing this now and saying that I want to give, because we are at time and I would want to be very respectful of your time. We do, I just wanted to ask if you all panelists here would like, before we close, just take one or two minutes to add anything that you want to add, answer that particular question, uh, react to anything that Malaika said, or just whatever that you want to share as a, as a, closing, uh, as a closing point. Uh, so I'm, ask, I'm going to ask you first, Asi, because your, your hand is up. Thank you very much, Francois. Um... One, I'd, 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 someone had already stated it in the in the chat, but I just would like to re, uh, re, reiterate it. Um, I am under 40 and I've been part of this project and there are other people in this project that are even under 30. So um, in a way, the intergenerational conversation linkage has, has even happened through the, the team that was put together to, to make this film. And so for the older feminists who were on this project, who were the, the lead investigators who called us in, um, we're grateful that we, we got this experience and, and, and got to share in uh, all this uh, incredible stories of, of, of these women and dead or alive. I also just want to quickly draw um, uh, a certain attention. Actually, Malika, with the LGBT law, uh, anti da, 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 everything that all the drama that happened there were a lot of older activists actually who had put their their head or their necks on the line um, almost chopped off you know because beyond the narratives that we were hearing on on tv and radio about them and what we we're reading online about them we thought, some of us found ourselves in certain spaces where we hadn't declared our identities as to you know, our take on activism and et cetera. And we just listen to our ordinary people talk and you will be amazed the kinds of narrative that have informed about these older women act activists who were actually um, against this law and have spoken up and have signed petitions, et cetera. But I also think that it's just that we are in a time where there's so much information coming across and going that sometimes we lose some of the things in the in the moments you know and so and i've also been on twitter where i've seen younger activists really being very nasty to older activists so i i think that the and and, and i think sometimes that the people who even are anti-women activists enjoy this i think they, they almost play us into this place like sometimes how in the in the in the conversation about race how sometimes black is black is pitched against each other. Sometimes I think these things also happen. And I think we should be careful, older and younger generations, we should we should also be on the lookout for some of these things. Because now it's not just we we think that the, the, the fight is uh, at certain points, this is also part of one of our struggles. That there, there are certain intentional ways of actually breaking our fronts. And so uh, and so then we have certain strange uh, in in-house um, antagonism switch of course it's it happens with human institutions but sometimes they are they are man-made more and they are made by whether we like it or not people who do not want our forces to move forward so i think that for all of us the older the younger those coming up we all should be also aware of all these subtle traps that become bigger problems much 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 later and so um that's my take. Thank you so much to say for, for closing on those words. I'm going to turn to Hilary to ask if you want to share some closing remarks briefly. Thank you. Um, thank you very much. And thank you, Asse. You said exactly what I was uh, going to react to. Number one, that a lot of older, quote and unquote, uh, some people don't like the term, I don't mind, uh, um, activists, actually presented a submission to parliament and they were there, put their necks on the block and took a lot of vilification uh, for supposedly, you know, supporting this kind of thing at their age and all the baggage that comes with it. So um, it's not an ideological divide as such. 
as far as I'm concerned, I look at it as a more of a communication uh, divide because the intergenerational gap is there. We cannot, um, we cannot dispute it. I'm a grandma. And um, between ourselves and our children, there are these uh, you know, perspective differences that we need uh, to talk about. I'm not saying you are our children, far from it. I'm just saying it's a natural phenomenon. And this is why I think that the conversations are crucial and critical. And indeed, the fact that uh, Malaika raised these points means that we need the conversation and it has started. And all the points I brought out in my submission vis-a-vis -vis the intergenerational uh, discussion or uh, issue were points I picked up at the dialogue. This is exactly what uh, one side said, one side quote and the other. We must be careful about these dynamics. And ultimately, I think that's, we need to come together. We need to see what we can do together. There'll be differences, technology, medium, content, but there are parts that are non-negotiable. The ideologies we stand on, what we believe in. Uh, apart from that, as I've said, the difference is democracy. Thank you. Thank you so very much uh, for sharing that. I'm going to now turn to you, Pumla to ask if you want to share a few words as we close. Yes, I want to say thank you to Malaika. Um, I'm sure that was very uncomfortable uh, at the beginning, certainly. I think that, um, you know, this, this and, and, and to thank, you know, everybody, I mean, I, I thank you to everybody, but I want to talk to a little bit to, to Malaika specifically, um, well, to what she said, what she spoke about specifically. And I think that, I think you're absolutely right. And I think you're wrong and that's fine. But I think what is, what is, what I really value, I mean, I value everything you said, but I think that it's, a, this is, this is the work, the work that the, the work of, 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 of saying the uncomfortable thing that you did. And I'm sure you had a knot on your stomach and you were trying to think about, I don't want to sound defensive, but I don't want to sound on the offense. And how do I say it? Um, and I think that often we talk about, we all talk about how important it is to have difference in movement. And this is the difference, right? And this is, and we, and, we, and when we're taking it seriously, we have the difficult conversations. And this is how our movements have been able to make the gains that they have. Because no generation, I mean, I'm turning 50 in a few months. And so I, I, I teach 20 year olds, I'm not like annoyed, like, what do you mean you're the first? And then I talk to like, I'm, I'm interviewing a 90 year old South African feminist who lived in Ghana at some point, um, as well so she's talking about her Canadian friends and she's and she's irritated with me like oh your impatience and so I think I want to thank you again for putting that on the table because the intergenerational conversation is part of the difference and I don't I want to disagree with some of the other responses in terms of I don't think it's starting I think what you're helping us do well not helping us do it's your movement too part of what you kind of linking make, making sure we keep doing is we have to keep having the conversation about 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 difference because it's not as though I don't I we weren't fighting when we were in our you know it's not like it, I, I I'm not fighting with people in their forties and fifties who are who are my generation of, of feminists of feminists either that in fact the way in which we change the world is by taking seriously and keeping seriously the the, the differences including the differences in how we characterize it by each other so I just wanted to really 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 kind of underscore just how much I appreciate it. It made me uncomfortable, but thank you. I think, I think, I think we, 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 if we take our movement and ourselves seriously, what we come from and what we're continuing to build, we have to be able to sit with that um, and take seriously that discomfort um, when we just in the parts of the parts we agree with and the parts we disagree with. So I just wanted to appreciate you and, um, and thank you so much. It's been so wonderful to be here with all of you to see Kina again um and to and, and and to just listen to everybody and um thank you so 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 much and um and a quadruple thank you to um i'm gonna say her name and then i'm gonna run away um hillary um Bederman and 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 um her generation and and of course the filmmakers um Aseye and dr skinner i'm sorry about my boo boo last week where i thought you were a different kate skinner um 
Thank you so much, AWDF, for putting this together. And I can't wait for this film to be available so I can watch it 20 times and drive everybody crazy about it. Thank you so much, Fumla. Uh, I was going to give uh, a keynote the floor, but uh, because you've spoken directly to Malika, I wanted to give Malika one minute. We are beyond time, but I want you to, uh, to ask if sure. you want to say anything before we close. Thank you, Francoise. No, um, I just want to say thank you um, to Professor Pumla and um, all of you actually for even, you know, it is true that it's uncomfortable, but I don't feel like it wasn't possible. Um, and I think that's really important. Um, and I mean, I appreciate the back and forth and it's true and we can disagree with each other. People can always say, you, you could have done more and we, but it's also important to um, acknowledge what was done. And I say you're absolutely right. And we watched, um, Professor Chikata at the parliament and I was, you know, proud and I was happy because I was at the African Studies um, Institute, as you know, for a while. So um, not to take away, um, but um, also to, you know, yeah, to just say. <laughs> so thank, thank you, you and I'll give it back to you. Thank you so much, Malika. And I think can I chip in? Yes, I was going to ask you if you want to do that now. I want to thank Malika. Um, I second everything that Pumla has said. The caution is that, um, so one of the big critiques I have of the older generation is on um, queer issues. I think, um, and even and, and, and even the um, homophobia, and let me just say transphobia, homophobia within the African feminist movement, this is, it's, uh, it's, it's something we must deal with. I am, I don't, as a, I think I'm in the middle of Malaika and my mother's generation. I don't really care how my mother's generation feel. My mother is different. She's queer, she's very queer friendly. But, but the newness of the issue, because some of these issues are new things that we are really, really taking up. We, are, we have to be bold about. The thing is the older generation have one up us on, tactics and strategies, you see. So sometimes, and then lots of the times, this is why you want to, you want to, you want to take their tactics and move with the new issue. Because that, this is what it is. It's like, how do we kill a bill? How do we get our, our, how do we open up our spaces? I've been in places where feminist thing that, that un, unprovoked, this was like 10 years ago. You know, I've forgotten her name. I think she was at that time, the head of Wilda, she just got up and said, we don't want gay marriage in Ghana. I said, you and who don't want? All provoked though, nobody had even said anything, right? So like I said, there are critiques. Um, the point about not going into the archives is that a section is that stuck. I get very irritated with cooking politics with my, I just like, I'm like, you know, this is done. Make a decision, move on, there are other things, right? Because the previous generation have actually lived this. If there was freedom to be had in any of these, if there was freedom to be really had in heterosexual relationships as constructed now, more women will be free. So sometimes we just have to move on because that's, it's not, it's not we, we need to make our decisions, take our bold decisions and move on based on the lives that they have lived. Um, I love uncomfortable questions. So thank you, Malaika. Um, but as I just thought that I want to say, we just do not want to waste the time. That we do not want to waste the energies. We do not want, we want to build upon, you see. Um, we, we, need, we desperately need to build upon, charge the, go into the spaces we need to address because it seems, and not that it seems, particularly for younger women, in terms, when we talk about the freedoms that we have, the key freedom, some of the key freedoms that has to do with bodily integrity, rape culture, consent, sexual health, we haven't made any traction on these. And as, as you know, um, all women face this, but younger women particularly so. So the Ghana is just a horrible place for, for, for younger women. And, 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 some, and these we need to address on top. So there's a lot to do a lot to do. We are not going to agree on everything, right? But absolutely we must learn on the tactics because absolutely they've done it. On the issues that they could do, they did, they've been doing it, they have. So yes, do you see what I'm saying? Thank you. Thank you, thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, and I want to say 
huge thanks to all of you. And I know uh, we are, we taken a bit more of your time that we had said. Uh, thank you for everyone who stayed with us uh, throughout the entire webinar. Thank you so much to the when uh, Women Speak film team. All of you, I can't wait, as, as Pumla said, for the movie to be available uh, online. Uh, and I'm, I'm so delighted that we at, as AWDF could help, you know, uh, show some parts of it, but also like start some of the conversations that can be taken from, from, from such a film. I'm also uh, very, very grateful uh, to all the panelists who came today. Uh, Hillary, thank you so much. And we need to talk about that jacket. Kina, <laughs> Kina, thank you so much for your passion. Pumla, thank you. I say, Kate. And of course, Malaika, I really appreciate you being here. I always say that, um, you know, uh, I strongly believe two things when I hear all of you speak about this last part of the conversation is that one, uh, there's no, uh, I don't think that there's any, um, growth that comes from easy conversations. So I'm so glad that we have the courage and that you led us with your courage, Malaika, raising that, uh, those, those, those tough points. So I can't wait for us. And this is for me, something that we keep need to, to grow on. And secondly, I keep thinking about how we, we talk about it because it's, um, it's how our brains work. Like we put groups, you know, like the younger ones, the older ones, and, and we, we need to remind ourselves of all the different nuances and the mosaic of experiences and perspectives, which is what make that conversation so difficult because we're talking, who, who is this group we're talking about and what are the different, is this, does this group actually exist beyond the age, you know, because there's so many nuances. So I want to say, I can't wait for this uh, conversation. Uh, and if there's any ways in which us as AWDF, we can contribute to that. I just want to hear it from everybody who's here. And we that's very much part of what, what we're also doing um, in addition to all of our work around like supporting, um, uh, you know, supporting the, the work of our, the, organiza the organizations financially, et cetera. So this movement building, come from conversations within movement. And this was a beautiful one. Thank you so much for bringing your passion, your expertise, your jokes, uh, and your beautiful smiles. We are so thankful for also the team of interpreters who've been working and allowing us to French speakers to be part of these conversations, as well as the uh, AWDF communications team, uh, Lydia and her team, Karen, Dina. Without you, there was none of this. So thank you so very much. Everybody, bon appétit, it's lunchtime here. Enjoy your food and enjoy the rest of your day. <laughs> Have a great afternoon. Thank, Thank you. you so Thank you much for to everybody us. for coming. For the interpreters, sorry for those of us who speak too fast. <laughs> Thank you. Bye. Thank you, Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank, Thank, Thank you very you. much. Bye, Malaika. Bye, Bye, Bye everyone. <laughs> Good to see you. <laughs> Good to see you too. <laughs> Bye. Bye. Okay, I think we can stop the recording now.